It's time for Sunday Q&A. We have a really good Sunday Q&A for you today. We're gonna answer a lot of your questions, including why in the world is there electric fencing around our kid's play place? How do we deal with raw milk so that it doesn't poison our family? And whether or not I can play that banjo. So let's get right in to Sunday Q&A. In last week's Sunday Q&A, we asked you whether or not you liked or disliked YouTube commercials being played in the middle of the videos. Most of you said you did not, and we heard you, and a lot of the reasons why was because of the ad placement completely interrupting the flow of the video. So we're gonna try something in today's episode, in the middle of the episode, and we'll get to that later. But on that topic, Keith asked us, do YouTubers have control over the ads that play or where they are placed? I think YouTube Core makes those decisions. Keith, YouTubers have a lot of control over the ads, not complete control. So the way this works is when I'm uploading a video, I can select whether or not to monetize a video. If I select not to monetize it, there would be no ads. There would also be much less videos because a demonetized channel there's not as many people who want to make videos if they're not getting anything monetarily from them. You can also select how many ads to put in those videos and where to place them. So if I wanted to with this Sunday Q&A, I could fill this thing with ads. I could have multiple ads and I can set them exactly where I want them. So along the lines of interrupting the flow of a video, uh, lots of people said that they'd hate those middle ads because they completely inter interrupt the flow of the video, we could choose exactly where to put them. So later on in this episode, I'm going to take a commercial break to test out to see whether that's less obtrusive to you and get your feedback on it. So we'll deal with that when we are in the middle of the episode. Now, as far as can we select which ads play, uh, we can't pick like, I want to run Sprint ads or AT&T ads. <laughs> we can't say, oh, this is a really funny ad. I want to play that one. Uh, so we don't have that control. YouTube sells the ad spots for us, and we take what we get. So I hope that answers your question. Let's get to the next one. Jenny said, I know it's off topic, but I want to know if Kay is going to have a nice pantry at the new house. So as many of you know, we are moving to Pennsylvania soon, and... She wants to know if there's gonna be a nice large pantry. And Jenny, the answer is yes. One of the nicest things in the house that we're going to be in is the storage. There is lots and lots of storage. And as a lot of you know, a homesteader needs storage because you bring all this food in, whether it's meat, whether it's vegetables or fruits, whatever it is, you bring a lot of it in and you need a place to put it and keep it. And the new house has a lot more storage. There's also, this is so cool, there's an apple cellar at the new house. So my father-in-law used to have an orchard and he built an apple cellar and uh, it's down in the ground and we'll give you a tour of that soon. We're gonna next month be giving you a tour of the new farm, so stay tuned. The day's doing has a ton of questions for us. The one of them we're gonna skip, he asked what is in our medicine cabinet? And uh, just know we're going to do a future video on the medicine cabinet. I didn't want to cover that today. It'd be, it's very specific. It's a great video to make. And so that gave us the idea. And stay tuned. Days doing will cover that. Uh, but he did ask what was in a liquid jar that Kay is using for teat cleaning. He said uh, it didn't look like iodine. But in fact, it is iodine. And that's a teat dip cup. And I'll have a link below for the stuff that we use for milking so you can find that iodine in that teat dip cup teat dip cup <laughs> so all you do is you just dip the teats in that uh, and it works so that the iodine that you dip the teats in then gets dumped out and the iodine that's in the cup doesn't get any of the bacteria in it it separates it the way it works it's pretty cool the next question that the day's doing asked uh, he talked about having no pasture for the cow and they were going to have to feed them a dairy feed grain mix. So what type of feed grain mix do you feed Ladybug? Is it compatible to feed your pigs with? So Day's doing, you do not want to mix dairy cow feed and pig feed. Sorry, I know it would make life simpler, but you don't want to do that. The 
pig feed is designed to grow pigs. The dairy feed is designed for dairy cows. And if, a, if you have a really good feed source, they will have that ground specifically for the animal. The rumen is developed to digest grass, not grain. And so if you throw like big grain pellets inside of that cow, it makes it harder for the rumen to digest. It makes it harder for the cow to digest that dairy feed. Now, some people decide not to give a cow any dairy feed, uh, no grain whatsoever. However, there are people who have lost their cows uh, to just essentially malnutrition and because they refuse to give them grain. So for us, we do supplement with grain. It's an organically grown, GMO-free grain that's done locally, and the farmer we get it from, he grinds it ultra fine. It's a powder, and that's because it's easier for the cow to digest that way. So try to find yourself a very specific dairy feed for your cow. And another good tip for you, you can buy your cow, obviously hay for lack of pasture, there's a product called chaff hay that we use, and the chaff hay is, they call it pasture in a bag. It's a lot of really good quality fermented grasses. Really good for the cow, easy for them to digest. It's got a really rich smell to it. So if you don't have good pasture but you still want to have a cow, yes, get them a good quality dairy feed, and also get some chaff hay pasture in a bag. And we'll have links below for that. And uh, finally... He addresses if the two could eat the same grain mix, it would save some money. It's true, days doing it would, but it would affect your animals negatively. And if you're trying to grow pigs for meat and cows for milk, it's two different things. I'm doing tea this morning with the sore throat, just a cinnamon tea. It's really nice. Jay Reed has a bit of a morbid question, he says. He wants to know what happens if the cow dies inside of the barn uh, how do you get it out? And he says a lot of homesteaders don't have tractors to deal with it. That is true. A lot of homesteaders don't have tractors to deal with it. However, we do have machines that we can use, and uh, that's what we would have to do. But you don't have to leave a cow inside of a barn, JJ, so our suggestion is don't leave your cow inside of your barn. <laughs> it's more to clean up. Uh, and unless the weather is really, really bad, they don't need to be inside of a barn. Victor wanted to know if we've ever set up an automatic water system like Matt in his Off the Ranch vlogs did. Victor, I couldn't find what the automatic watering setup was that you're talking about. So I don't know how to answer this perfectly. We have set up automatic watering systems before. Uh, you can check out Farmer Brad. He makes automatic waterers for chickens. He's got a YouTube channel. We'll link to it. Uh, he also has a lot of other chicken-related products. Um, I personally usually don't set up automatic waterers for most of the situations we have. There are some where it works great, but there are some where it's not great. And for me, if I can't monitor it closely, I don't like setting up automatic waterers for animals that can like get dumped or knocked over and then wind up water running constantly. We're on a well. We can run that well out, especially in the dry heat of the summer. Uh, we do from time to time set up automatic waterers as long as we can have them, you know, dumped over proof. <laughs> Uh, and as long as the fittings and everything are really secure and really tight. Now, there is one animal that we use the automatic water for all the time, and that's our pigs. Our pigs are on an automatic uh, pig nipple, and I wouldn't raise pigs without that. Pigs are just a horrible disaster when it comes to drinking out of buckets. They knock them over. They break them. You don't want to deal with buckets. You want to have the pigs drinking from the nipples. You can hard line create a, a nice hard line hose connection to them and mount them to the wall and the pigs have fresh water instantly whenever they want it and it's clean and it's just the best way to do it. So we do automatic waters with all our pigs. Lily Homestead had a great question. They wanted to know, do you plan to do the same things in PA that you are doing now as far as sale of your farm products, pigs, chicken, and how do the laws rules and regulations compared to where you are now? Lily, this is a really good question for 
anyone to consider when they're going to be moving to a new location and setting up a homestead or a farm. We are not planning on doing the same things. It's not that we don't want to do those things, but we have to make sure if we're going to run a business that we're meeting the needs of the market there. And the market there is very different than the market here. The market we're moving into is much more rural. The cost of living is much lower. The average earned income is much lower. There's a lot of Amish communities there who sell agricultural produce, meats, very inexpensively. So instead of moving into a new place with an idea in my head already, I'm going to go in there and start being the pig guy and selling pork and selling chicken. Uh, I have to go there. I have to go to the local farmer's markets and see what's for sale and see what people ask. I have to look at the property through a new set of eyes, a pair of eyes I've never looked at it, the eyes of someone who's going to farm off of it. Uh, so there's a lot of questions I need to answer. I'm not going to move in with any real set ideas. Instead, I'm going to observe what's there as far as the property goes and as far as the need the market has for what we want to do and uh, then adjust to that. So I hope that makes sense. As far as the rules and regulations where we're moving to, how do they compare? There are some big differences. For example, uh, Connecticut allows on-farm slaughter, which a lot of states don't if it's a custom slaughtering. Uh, Connecticut also is really flexible on the sale of raw milk, as opposed to a lot of states that aren't. Um, I don't know the exact regulations where we're going, so I'm going to have to look into that. But there are definitely some differences. Wade says, play your banjo. And... We've had another user who's asked us in a few different videos, Gay, whether or not I can play the banjo. This is a common question here on the channel. The banjo's hanging behind me. Come on, Aust, play the banjo. Okay, here we go. I don't play the banjo. The banjo's actually Kay's. She was learning to play the banjo uh, back in the early days when we met, which brings us to our next question. Katie wanted to know how we met. So the way Kay and I met, I was recording music, which is what kind of led me into recording podcasts and doing this whole show. And a friend of Kay's, her roommate, needed to record a, a CD for her parents' anniversary. She wanted to record some songs for her parents' anniversary. And so she asked me, she called me up and said, would you help me with this project? Sure, I'd love to. She came and she needed someone to play the piano. So Kay plays the piano. Fantastic. She's awesome on the piano. And uh, she came, played the piano that night. I did the music recording. We made beautiful music together. The rest is history. I do play the guitar. Do you want to hear the guitar? I don't mind stealing bread from the mouths of decadence. Oh. There, that's my best with the sore throat. Home Awards Fun Stuff asks how to get my female duck to like two new baby ducks. She swims away or moves away from them. This is a tough one home awards if your duck doesn't accept her ducklings there's not much you can do we have had this happen before where the duck just kind of runs away from her ducklings she doesn't have attachment to them uh, some days you can find another duck sometimes you can find another duck that is willing to accept these ducklings as her own but Usually that's if you have another duck with a another group of ducklings that's like exactly the same age, hatched at the same time, and you can just kind of sneak them in there. Otherwise, they can actually do the opposite and be territorial. So this one, if the duck doesn't take care of her ducklings, you're going to have to just do it yourself. You're going to have to take them in and brood them yourself. Sorry. Bill Carson asks how... 
big is our pig pen? And do we use hog panels? And if so, how many? Bill, we custom built our pig pen to match not hog panels, uh, actually goat panels. And this was at the suggestion of the guy that we buy our feeder pigs from. Before we had our first pigs, I went and toured his farm and his name is Tom. You can see him in some of our pig videos. If you watch our pig playlist, you'll see Tom in our videos. Tom Dexter, he's a great source if you're looking for pigs in Connecticut. Tom said to use not hog panels, but actually goat panels because for small pigs and any other livestock, goat panels have the smallest squares and they keep everything in. I've never had anything escape from goat panels except for goats, of course. Of course, goats can break out of goat panels. <laughs> Get yourself some goat panels and we actually buried ours right into the concrete. Goat panels come 16 feet long and so our pig pen is 16 by 16 and it's 16 by 16 on the one side or so it's 16 and 16 on the one side and then 16 and 16 the other side however those sides have gates so we took one more panel it's actually three panels and two eight foot gates we cut that 16 panel in half put it on the other side with two gates so there's two gates there's a nice pig house concrete pad automatic nipple water like i talked about already and that works fantastic for holding pigs. If you have just like two pigs, you can raise them in that their entire life. That's what we did the first year. The next years we opened up to grass and dirt around the pig pen for the pigs to be out on pasture on. And they like that too. Uh, they just destroy pasture, so keep that in mind. If you're thinking about raising feeder pigs, I just did a entire master class on raising feeder pigs. And you can find that in the Homesteady Pioneer Library. If you become a, a Pioneer, it's just five bucks a month. If you click there, you can become a Pioneer. You help to support this show and help us to do this show every day. And in return, you get access to all the Pioneer benefits. So there's a forum that I'm in checking on every day, answering questions. There's bonus content, bonus videos and podcasts. Uh, you can download all the podcasts instantly. And there's a library of master classes right now we just added the pig feeder pig master class it's a class everything you need to know before you get feeder pigs there's a master class on raising chickens uh, on using movable electric fencing uh, there's a really good one about food preservation taught by a culinary instructor uh, there's a master gardening class there's a lot of really great master classes that you can watch instantly you can stream them on demand you can watch everything it's five bucks a month, or if you want to do the whole year, it's fifty dollars for the whole year. So you save, you know, ten dollars doing it that way. So consider becoming a pioneer. All you have to do is click on that little guy right there to become one. And we thank you so much for doing that. It's a huge help. Candice Christensen asks us, "How do you feel about Premier One's fencing? You seem to like everything else they sell." Candice, I love everything Premier One sells. Uh, they make great quality products and their electric fencing is great. Uh, you won't be disappointed. Now there are some products Premier One doesn't make as far as electric fencing goes that I use other companies. And generally when I'm doing not netting, when I'm doing the other electric fencings, just the twine or the braid or the rope, I'll go with Gallagher. Gallagher has some really smart electric fencing products. So I use both Gallagher and Premier One, and I'll have a link below. I think Dean gets a question in every one of our Q&As. Dean asks us about uh, chickens and sharing nest boxes uh, with clutches of chicks. Have we dealt with aggression from the hens towards each other's chicks when it comes to shared space in the coop? So other chickens can be aggressive to other chickens' chicks. However, Dean, mama hens are really good, as far as what we've always seen, they've always been really good at protecting their chicks and warding off the other chickens. So as long as you don't have more clutches than you do nest boxes, I think you'll be fine. But if you only have like two nest boxes and you have multiple 
hens hatching, that will not work. You need them to have their own nest box to raise their clutch in. So make sure you have enough nest boxes for each of your clutches of, the, of broody hens. And if you do that, you'll be great. Catherine wanted to know if Luna was getting enough milk because she noticed that we're feeding the baby goats ladybug's milk. So don't worry, Luna is getting plenty of milk. We actually just had the vet here on the farm, as you can see in the disbudding videos. The vet, large animal vet, we asked him, how's Luna look? Does she look big enough, healthy enough? He said she looks great. He said it's, sometimes it's hard to tell with cattle, and he also mentioned that he could never tell over YouTube watching a video whether or not an animal was healthy. Sometimes we get people commenting, that calf looks too thin or that calf looks too fat. The vet said there's no way to tell. you got to be there looking right at the animal, and he's been doing it for decades. Uh, he says Luna looks great. She's healthy. She's, she's great. <laughs> We're still getting Luna every day on her mom. Some commercial dairies would have Luna weaned a long time ago, uh, but we like using her for the milk share, the uh, calf sharing procedure where you use the calf to help keep the milk process going. And the baby goats are getting milk. Kay is actually milking twice a day now to keep up with the demand, and she's doing a fantastic. She's getting us two gallons a day from twice a day milking and with Luna still on, uh, which is awesome. Oh man, it's still hot. Exotic Critter wanted to know the names of the animals. She says, we know Ladybug and Luna Moth, uh, Bones the dog. Do you name any of the other animals? And uh, if so, what are their names? Talking about the goats and the chickens. So some of the chickens have names. My kids' chickens have names. There's Cinnamon Stick and Bluebird and Cake. There's Mary and Pattern. Uh, the goats do not yet all have names. Our goat does have a name. I don't remember the registered name. I think it's something like Zania Joy. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> Kay knows it. I don't. Uh, and then the other older buck is, I believe, named Gemini. I think it's Gemini. Um, and then the younger buck, I don't think there is a name yet. So we're still working on names for all the goats. You'll find out when we name them all. And I think that's pretty much, oh, our ducks, of course. If you're a duck owner, you have to name your ducks. So we have Don and Betty Draker. Jay Sullivan says, that's an awesome flannel. What kind is it? I actually don't remember Jay Sullivan, but let's find out together. Weatherproof Vintage. I got it at Sierra Trading Post. Discounted. It was reasonable on Sierra Trading Post. I will have a link in the description below for these flannels. I have to say, I'm impressed. They uh, definitely hold up. I burned through weak, weekly made flannels, and this one so far, all the buttons are still on it. It's rugged. Jay Sullivan, I like it. Speaking of flannels, the Garden Channel says this. I literally laughed out loud. I have to ask. Do you have any other shirts, Aust? <laughs> no. No, this is all I have. I'm notorious for owning like three shirts. My friends make a big deal when I get a new shirt. Tom asked us how much it would have cost if we started our homestead from scratch. Tom, that's a crazy question. I don't even want to think about how much money I've spent on this homestead that I'm about to move away from. <laughs> we spend a lot on the farm every year. The farm that we run, the infrastructure projects we do, we spend easily $15,000 a year on this thing, probably more most years. Um, so it really has to do with what you want to do and where you're starting from. The homestead that we have here was at zero pretty much, and we've put everything into it every year. The homestead we're moving to has a barn, has water run to it, um, has some fences and some fencing. So we'll be in a better place moving there than we were moving here, which hopefully means we can invest more into other things and not just the basic infrastructure. Smallwood Homestead saw in one of our previous videos that I mentioned going to farms to get on-farm experience before you really dive into homesteading. And she said that she lives 65 miles away from any of the nearest farms. Any advice to make things a bit easier? 
Uh, for a 50-year-old gal homesteading for the first time, I grow my own food but have no animals at the moment. So Smallwood Homestead, if you can't go experience a farm firsthand and those animals firsthand, that's okay. You can still get into a lot of this. Read books, do research, and most importantly, start small. Don't read a book on pigs, do a bunch of research on pigs, and then get 10 of them. Get just two of them, and that way, if you don't like it, two are easy to process, put in the freezer, and be all done with. Samantha asks, do you drink your raw milk? If not, what do you have to do to get it ready for your family to drink? Samantha, we do drink raw milk, and... The pasteurization process that is used on industrial milk uses like tubing and it's it's very high tech. They don't just like put a pot on a stove and heat it to a boil and then take it off. We like raw milk. We enjoy the raw milk that we get from our cow. But to make sure that it's safe for our family, we do take a few precautions. So first you need to make sure you have a healthy cow and that starts with healthy pastures, healthy management. We're going to do a whole nother video on the equipment Kay uses and the process that she goes through milking uh, to ensure good sanitary conditions. We take extra precautions that a lot of people may not as far as sanitation goes. You'll notice Kay uses rubber gloves when she is milking. That's to prevent the cow from getting staph A. Uh, so we make sure to keep everything clean from the get-go. Milk, when it's inside of the udder, milk is totally um, um, sterile. That's the word. Milk is sterile in the udder. No germs, no bacteria. As it comes into the world, it is then instantly getting bacteria, whether it's from the teats itself, if there was an infection in the teats, that can get into the milk. Uh, when it hits that bucket, if there's debris in the bucket, maybe some little flecks of poo from an animal or hay that has poo on it, there's some bacteria. And then as you transfer the milk inside, there's dust, there's dirt. Once it gets inside, it gets poured into jars. If those jars are not properly sanitized, there can actually be a film on those jars from past milk with bacteria on it. So here you have this totally clean substance coming into the world, but then bacteria, 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 bacteria. Now, the dangerous bacterias that you're worried about getting your family sick, they those bacterias can't multiply quickly in a refrigerated cool temperature. So as long as your milk comes into the world with very limited bacteria getting into it, and then you chill that milk quickly so that it brings that temperature that those bacteria cannot multiply, you will have a safe amount of bacteria in that milk to drink, a safe percentage, and so your family will be okay. But if you have a cow who has an infection and instantly that milk gets bacteria into it, and then you take your time getting that milk chilled, and when your family goes to drink raw milk, they take it and they leave it on the counter, and they forget that it's there and it sits out on the counter, yeah, raw milk, even from a cow in your backyard, can absolutely make you sick. It's, it's like any other food item, perishable, and bacteria can grow in it. And milk is a very nice substance for bacteria to multiply in at the right temperatures. So make sure if you're going to do raw milk for your family, um, that you first and foremost, you re do your research, know that there are some dangers and some risks to it. But if you're smart, if you have a healthy cow, you do everything you can to keep everything super sanitary, you get that milk chilled really quickly, and you keep it chilled and you go through that milk, you know, within a reasonable amount of time. For us, a gallon of milk is gone within two days. Uh, yeah, if you do that, you have nothing to worry about. But if you don't do that, if you mess up those steps along the way, you absolutely can get your family sick. And it's something you need to be serious about. Too many homesteaders believe in the natural myth, which is, Oh, if you do things naturally, nothing bad can ever happen. Do it the way it's done in nature and nobody ever gets sick. Well, animals get sick and die all the time in nature. 
and animals on a farm get sick and people on a farm do get sick. We got sick this winter. The whole doing it natural thing doesn't mean you never get sick and nothing bad ever happens. So make sure to take precautions. And if I were not overseeing this myself, this raw milk for my family, uh, I would be very, very picky as to who I purchased raw milk from. We purchased raw milk before we had our cow. And we purchased it from a dairy. The man was doing it for decades. It was a very clean dairy. They used milking machines, so the milk came out. If the milk is totally sterile coming out of the cow and it comes into a sterile milking machine, well, there's no introduction of bacteria there. It got chilled. It got tested. If something went wrong, they would shut down the milk for the week and say, sorry, you can't buy. We had our numbers checked and there's a high number of this listeria or a high number of that. Uh, I trusted them, but I don't think I would buy milk from very many like small homesteaders or small farms personally unless i knew they were really on top of their game and really serious about making a good quality product and i'm not trying to scare you away from raw milk and i we love raw milk we enjoy it but i do want to make sure that you take it seriously because i think too many people that natural myth gets too many homesteaders you know swept off their feet with the idea that as long as you do it the way nature planned, you'll all be fine and everything's great. We got more questions about the commercials and how they benefit the channel monetarily speaking. So Schwinn Quality Homestead says they love our channel and they want to know more about the commercials. They say, I feel that since you provide entertainment and information, I definitely want you to profit from them. Do you still get paid if we push skip add button on the commercial or do we need to watch the entire thing? So Schwinn, I've been doing some research. I've been trying to find the exact answer on how all the monetization works. Um, and so what I have found so far is that the best way to benefit our channel monetarily with commercials is to watch them all the way through. I'm not telling you to do that. If you hate commercials, it's your right as a YouTuber to watch our content and click skip. If you want to support us without watching the commercials, you can shop through our Amsteady link. So before you go shopping on Amazon, just go to amsteady.com and it will forward you to Amazon and all your purchases will get an affiliate bonus for. Uh, so if you hate commercials but you want to keep supporting us, do the Amsteady thing. Or again, you can become a pioneer. There's lots of ways to support us. Uh, and just, I mean, sharing our channel with other people is a great way to support us too. However, if you want to support us with the use of the YouTube commercials, watching the whole commercial is seems to be the best way to do that. And a direct Fletch asks a similar question. Uh, he says, how long should I leave them the pop-up images before closing them? And uh, I direct Fletch, I actually couldn't find an answer on the pop-up. So if anybody knows, you can comment below. Um, when it comes to YouTube commercials, we really want them to not ruin the experience of our videos. And so in last week's video, we asked about middle breaks commercials in the middle and how you felt about them. And a lot of people really hated them. But some people said they actually prefer them because they're shorter. And so what I've decided based off last week's reactions is in most of our videos, you will not see a middle commercial. Sunday Q and A's are long videos. And I was thinking about putting a middle commercial in the Sunday Q and A. Most of you said that you hate them because of how intrusive they are, how they interrupt the flow. So what I want to test this week with right now, we'll test it out and we'll see what you think. I'm going to give a commercial break. I'm going to say, thanks for watching this video to this point. There's going to be a brief commercial. And when we come back, you're going to find out why I have electric fencing around my kid's play place. So don't go anywhere. Homesteady will be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. And we're back. That really helps the channel. It helps us make a living off of this channel. If you hate it so much, please let me know because like we said in a lot of videos this week when we talked about clickbait and titles and thumbnails and last week talking about commercials, we do care about your feedback. If you hate that, I'm not gonna do it. So let me know, was that horrible or can you live with that to help us make a living off this thing? Let's keep the communication open. I will be reading, as I always do, all your comments below. Now, on to our next question. 
we were asked why we have a electric fence around our kids' play place. Amy says, why do you have electric fencing around the kids' play structure? Is it to keep chicken beep off of it? <laughs> Congrats on the quick offer. So Amy, it's not for chickens actually. The reason that we have electric netting around our kids' play place, our kids' play place was originally sand. And <clears throat> sore throat's getting me this morning. Cats love to use sand as a litter box. So the kids' play area was becoming a litter box, and that was disgusting. So we went and put wood chips in, thinking wood chips will surely dissuade the cats from using this as a litter box. Nope, they still liked digging in the wood chips and dropping a deuce. So we figured the only way to keep these cats out of this play area is to put up electric netting. So we have a solar power charger and the electric netting. Obviously, when the kids go and play, we turn it off. The kids know how to turn it off so they can go in, they can swing, and they can jump out. Now, an added bonus was, yes, it kept the chickens out of there. And at the time, we had the giant turkey, which if you've been watching us since we had the turkey, you know the giant turkey was coming after the children. So it kept him out too. So it had benefits. In our future homestead, one of the really nice things about where we're going is there's a really big play swing set that's far, far away from any of the animals. So there won't be that mix. Uh, Andrea Cutter asked, how much are we selling our farm for? Uh, so Andrea, our farm, we're asking around 340 for it. And if you wanna find out more information, you can click on the link below. That'll take you to our website. And uh, through that form, we'll put you in touch with our realtor. Uh, if you're interested in buying a beautiful homestead in Connecticut, we do have a offer right now, but we are not in contract yet. Uh, we'll keep updating you as that happens. Uh, so we are pursuing this offer, but we're not under contract yet. So if, if you wanted to buy this place, there is still time, but that time is shrinking. So speaking of moving, not your average guy says where in PA. So we're telling everybody where we're going is uh, near Pittsburgh. We're not getting too much more detail than that because, you know, privacy. <laughs> um, where are you going to do, are you going to do classes or seminars on your new homestead? So yes, we will be doing some events on the homestead. And for as far as that goes, when we announce events, the way we usually handle events and making sure you know where we're located is... The information of the event will tell you the location, and when you buy a ticket, you'll know exactly where we are. Uh, but because we're an internet program and anybody in the world can find the YouTube channel, uh, we're, we're not going to tell exactly where we live, just, you know, privacy. It's nice to keep, there's got to be a line of privacy somewhere, and exactly our address is one of those places that we generally keep private until we have an event. And for those events, you know, obviously you have to tell people, well, we're located here, come and find us. <laughs> but as far as just leaving our address out there, yeah, we're going to keep that, you know, to ourselves and um, just let you know we're about an hour out of Pittsburgh. Brad wanted to know if we're going to keep doing YouTube videos when we go to the bigger farm. Absolutely. We're going to keep doing YouTube, keep doing the podcast. If you're a podcast listener, we haven't got a, uh, another episode out in the last couple weeks. Uh, because we're kind of changing the format, we're going to be doing a bit of a diary, homestead diary format for the next couple months as we move. So me and Kay are going to be doing that together, and we're just working out the kinks for that. So stay tuned. There'll be more podcasts coming out. Jim Clare, super supporter of our channel. Jim watches probably all our videos and uh, comments a lot. So thanks, Jim, for being a, a supporter of Homesteady. He wanted to no, he's trying to find out when we first upload videos so he can be there ready to go. So Jim, every day I shoot to release our video about five o'clock. I have not yet got it down to a science where it's ready at five. Uh, I like five o'clock because I've noticed the peak watch time for our videos is about six o'clock in the evening. And this is Eastern Standard Time. So I know uh, you might not be in Eastern Standard Time. So I try to release the video Best practices on YouTube for getting good velocity, which we talked about in that week's video about clickbait, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, getting good velocity to a video, a lot of views quickly in the beginning is important. And I've noticed that if I release a video about five o'clock, our peak watch time is at six, lots of people watch that video, and then that video does well. So if you wanna be 
the first to watch our videos and leave that comment first. I'm trying to shoot for five o'clock and I think what I'm gonna do is start producing it so that it's I'm ahead one day so that I can have it every day at five. Boom, it's at five, show up at five and you'll see it. Uh, my worst case scenario is like six o'clock. If it's, you know, if I'm running late that day, sometimes it'll be out about six o'clock or if I have to do a last minute edit. Now, speaking about velocity and videos performing well, I wanted to talk a little bit more just quickly on the subject of clickbait. So in that video, which I gave an incredibly clickbait title to our clickbait video, it was supposed to be hyperbole. Some people got ticked off. People are really funny about this whole clickbait issue and it really annoys some people. So I did that video to explain our titles and our thumbnails and why we work the way we work. And I hope it answered a lot of questions uh, and I hope it explained to you, our subscribers, what our, our, the way we do things here. I never want to be deceptive, and we talk about it a lot in that video. The title and the thumbnail were completely clickbait because it was a video about clickbait, and I just was, it was hyperbole. I was having fun with it. If you got offended by it and unsubscribed for that, well, everyone needs to have a bit more of a sense of humor, and we'll just leave it at that. We got a lot of questions, a lot of questions about disbudding because of our disbudding video this week. Uh, some people wanted to know, can we chop the horns off later? Somebody wanted to know if you could saw them off. You, the best way to take care of horns on a goat is early, right in the beginning, disbudding or using the dehorning paste. You can chop them later, you can cut them, but there are blood vessels and nerves and it is a bloody traumatic experience and then flies can get in there and it's just a bad thing to take care of later. If you're going to have goats, we suggest not having goats with horns. We've done both and uh, some people, it doesn't bother them and they're not worried, but it, for us, it looks like an accident waiting to happen and if you're going to remove the horns, take care of the horn issue, you just do it early and it's the best thing. Our little guy, it's all done and he's fine and uh, there's no trauma, no long-term damage there. Dean asked if Accountant Mike had any tips for emergencies. Uh, we had an older video that he commented on and uh, I haven't ever asked Accountant Mike about this topic, but we do make sure and we suggest to viewers, as far as preparedness goes, you need to have an emergency fund. Uh, we followed a lot of Dave Ramsey's principles. I'll leave a link to Dave Ramsey's book that we used that helped us get out of debt completely. Uh, being debt-free is a great way to be. The first step in his baby steps, one of the first steps is to have a $1,000 emergency fund. And that way, if something goes wrong, you have some money to take care of that. So a uh, link to Dave's book and Really, if you're trying to get your money situation worked out, it really helped us. We are a debt-free family, and it's awesome to be debt-free. Um, also, as far as supplies go, um, so Dean was asking about hospital plans, savings, life insurance, ER bills, that sort of thing. Um, you know, yeah, you, you should be planning ahead for that. So that'd be a good topic to ask Accountant Mike, and we'll follow up on that. But having the emergency fund and life insurance for sure and medical insurance, it's important, and it's something that we do here. If you watched our disbudding video, you'll notice the vet sprayed a little bit of a silver aluminum spray. Uh, it was like a silver-colored spray on the spot where he had disbudded the goat. A lot of people asked, what was that silver spray? Um, so I will put a link to that below if you're looking for what the silver spray was. The idea is it forms like a, a barrier for infections or bacteria for getting in there. It just keeps it protected. And it same principle kind of behind blue coat too. Anything that's red. Uh, goats aren't like chickens. They don't peck each other at red spots. Uh, but it covers over it. It gives it a layer and keeps things from pecking at it or being attracted to it. Uh, so just a good... If you're, you know, for treating wounds and things, link below for that. The second video that we did about disbudding where we said it was the worst day for a goat owner, that title really bugged some people. Um, and that's why I did the follow-up video about clickbait. I called it, it's the worst day for goat owners, so why do we do it? As a goat owner who has dealt with dis disbudding in the past, all the animals die if you're going to be processing them for meat, 
the death of the animal that day is not the worst day for the owner because it's the day you've been working for. If you have dairy goats and they die, especially if a predator attacks, which happened to one of the commenters, that's that's awful and I don't want to take away from that. Uh, but that also is a surprise. Um, disbudding, you know it's coming and you got that pit in your stomach like, oh, I got to deal with disbudding. This year, having done it with the anesthesia has changed that completely. It was completely a much easier process, and uh, I will try to do that with the anesthesia from now on because it just was so much nicer. Um, but really, I mean, in our opinion, in my opinion, totally honest here, disbudding is the worst day because you know it's coming. It's a little baby. You got to do it with the hot iron, and it's just like it's the worst part of owning the goat. So I called the video. It's the worst day, and in the picture, the goat's laying down. You could it's a picture I have of him laying there with the buds colored. I was not trying to make you think the goat died, and I apologize for the miscommunication. You just have to remember when you get mad over the clickbait thing and the thumbnail and the title, a lot of times I'm working busy late into the day trying to get this video ready for that 5 o'clock deadline that I give myself. And with that video, it was like the end of the day. And I'm like, all right, what are we going to call this video? Yes, it's the, I hate this budding. That's the worst day for the goat owner. Um, all right, what am I going to use for a thumbnail? Oh, man, I only have two pictures. I have two screenshots that I got from the video the day before to work with. I already used the one. Oh, look at this one. You can see the buds. Perfect. Let me throw that on there. Good. Fire it off. Bad comment, bad comment, bad comment. Oh, man, I didn't even realize people were going to think he's he was dead. It's part of a continued conversation. We just did the video on disbudding. In my mind, it's like, oh, this was a disbudding video. They're going to see that thumbnail of the disbudded goat and know instantly what we're talking about. There's a miscommunication over the internet. That is common. Things get lost in translation. And I just wanted to let you know, I'm never ever trying to deceive you or trick you. And there were some very angry people in that video that were very mad about how that thumbnail and title work together. And there's no master plot here to deceive. It's just lost in translation over the internet. And I know most of you subscribers understand that. And most of you commented in the clickbait video, hey, Austin, we don't care what you do. We love your videos. We love your content. So keep doing what you're doing. So for you guys, thank you so much. And we're going to keep doing that. Keep doing what we're doing. <laughs> Finally, Diana asks us about the guineas. Diana says, I noticed you have guineas. Do your guineas roost in buildings or in the trees? Diana, it is very difficult to get guineas to roost in a building, but not impossible. Uh, the farm where we're going to, my mother-in-law has a herd of guineas that she has trained to go in every night. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, but you can do it. Our guineas, it didn't work that way. Fortunately for us, they roost every night in a cherry tree by our coop which is surrounded by electric netting. So for that reason, they have been safe from predators so far. A lot of times, guineas will just roost in any tree. You know, they'll fly up into this one, they'll fly up into that one, and when they do that, they're gonna be dead real fast because at nighttime, they're just sitting there on the tree and up goes the raccoon and he grabs them and it's game over. And every day you find one less guinea till you got none left and it's sad. But guineas are hard to train. We look at it every year like that's what we invest in tick control. We know we might lose them all, and that's the expense of tick control on the property. We hope not to. We do everything we can to try to train them to a coop or to a you know specific spot. We're excited to be moving to a place that has a guinea flock that goes in every night because it means we'll have those guineas for a long time taking care of that tick problem. And they are awesome for taking care of ticks. They really do a good job. Well, that's all the questions we're going to get to in today's Sunday Q&A. I apologize if we didn't cover your question. We just have so many questions coming in now, and uh, I'm trying to pick the ones that best benefit the most people. If you want to make sure we don't miss your question, here's a tip. When you leave a question on our channel, put hashtag ask home study. If you, hash, you know, hashtag ask home study, I will first and foremost, I'm going to search for that hashtag when I do my Sunday Q&As and those questions will get preference because I'll find them. The other ones I'm looking through questions, comments, 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 and sometimes I miss them. So if you want to get a question answered, hashtag ask homesteady and that will help you get your question answered much better. Two more things before we sign off here. Two more things. First, 
July 5th is coming. That's the next 100 days in this Try Something Scary. Uh, we're pushing for July 5th to reach 50,000 subscribers. So you could help us out by just sharing the channel. But more importantly, I challenged you to do something scary in your own life. And we had a ton of people tell us they're going to do scary stuff. And I'm really excited to see where we all are on July 5th. So don't forget that. And I wanted to acknowledge something in our clickbait video that a lot of you said. I talked about the two reasons you're watching this video is because either you thought the title and the thumbnail were interesting or because I sent you the link to say a response when you complained about clickbait on the channel. And so many people said you forgot about reason number three. Reason number three is because I watch all your videos and I love your videos and so any video you put out, there I am watching. I wanted to acknowledge you who do that, our faithful subscribers. A lot of you use a good workaround to the whole YouTube doesn't share our video problem that I talk about a lot. Um, you go to the subscriber tab and you watch our videos through the subscriber tab and that way you don't miss any of our videos and you're totally right about that. I know from reports that YouTube has put out that more people don't do what you do. More people go to that home browse feature and they just kind of browse through. That's even what I do when I watch YouTube. I don't go to my subscription page. I go to the browse page and I just look through the videos that YouTube suggests. Most users do that, which is why I'm so big on, hey, get on the email list so you don't miss any of our videos, etc. But I just wanted to say thank you for those of you who go through the trouble every day to find our video, no matter where you have to go to find it and make sure you watch it. Uh, those supporters, those subscribers, you mean so much to us. Your input means a ton to us, which is why we keep reading all these comments and questions below. Thank you. Thanks for helping this channel get to where we are. If you wanna leave a question for next week, just hashtag Ask Homesteady so I can find it. And if you want to anything, links below to any of the products that you were interested in, uh, the books, become a pioneer up there, support us in the ways you know how, and make sure to tune in tomorrow, because in tomorrow you're gonna see how much maple syrup we got from our maple syrup boiling. We'll see you in tomorrow's video. Coffee time.